The nine o'clock news now on BBC One with Michael Burke. Britain and America are preparing to evacuate foreigners from Kinshasa as a new revolution threatens to engulf the troubled heart of Africa. Yeltsin defends the ruble, but his people are now paid in gherkins. And Pooh's honeypot will go to charity, thanks to the gentlemen of the Garrick. Good evening. The Royal Marines are on standby to evacuate about 300 British citizens from the Democratic Republic of Congo, formerly known as Zaire. Rebel soldiers are closing in on the capital, Kinshasa, in what seems to be the climax of yet another bitter civil war. The country is huge, potentially rich, but destitute and in chaos at the centre of the most troubled region in Africa. The country's leader, Laurent Kabila, rose to the forefront of the rebel movement two years ago, leading the uprising against the dictator, President Mobutu. Last year, he entered Kinshasa in triumph and seized power. But this month, the soldiers he led have turned against him. They've joined forces with fellow tribesmen from Rwanda and now control a third of the country. Their next target is Kinshasa. This is a replay of last year's lightning insurrection with most of the same elements. A rebel army leapfrogging to victories across a vast country. A government backing away for want of popular support and ethnic hatred and allegations of atrocities against both sides. But this rebellion only began 12 days ago and it's moving even faster than the one that replaced Mobutu with Kabila. The new commander even uses the same rhetoric. We say no more dictatorship, no more tribalism, no more injustice, and no more being governed by thieves. The rebellion began when President Kabila fell out with Rwanda and Uganda, neighboring countries which had helped him to power, and it's now believed are helping his opponents. Since then, his army has split, he sacked the chief of staff and started recruiting a people's army. But now President Kabila has disappeared from view, and his people are waiting to see if he will also be toppled. It was only last year that Lauren Kabila was welcomed as a liberator from a corrupt dictator. But his opponents say he's proved as bad. He's packed his government with cronies, done little to improve the misery of daily life, and has desperately tried to gain popular support by stirring up tribal hatred against the Tutsis. I would say he was an extremely inept politician who, as the situation's got further and further out of his effective day-to-day -day control, has started resorting to some extremely frightening tactics. We're now seeing um, the emergence of what's known as hate radio on, on government wavelengths, uh, essentially encouraging the, the wholesale massacre of Tutsis and Tutsi-descended um, people. Last year, Britain sent Royal Marines to help evacuate foreign nationals. They're on standby again. America and France have warships standing off the coast. It's uncertain if President Kabila's government can survive or how much fighting there may be. A major dam supplying hydroelectric power to the capital is believed to be in rebel hands. It's just 135 miles from Kinshasa, an indication of how close the rebels are getting. Power to Kinshasa was cut off and although some has been restored, people are stocking up with water and supplies in case fighting reaches the streets. They may not welcome new rulers, but they're unlikely to fight for the last lot. President Kabila and his unruly troops, who came to power with such goodwill, have proved a general disappointment. Brian Hanrahan, BBC News. President Yeltsin has promised to defend the Russian currency and says the country's economy is not on the edge of disaster. Prices on the Russian stock market rallied this morning after two huge falls this week. Mr Yeltsin has called on the Russian parliament to adopt a new package of austerity measures. While storms have been raging through the financial markets, the Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, has been trying to show that he, at least, is refusing to panic. He's called an emergency meeting of the Russian parliament, but he isn't going to interrupt his holiday. <laughs> there's absolutely no way I'm cutting short my holiday now. If I do, they'll say there's turmoil, there's catastrophe. They'll say it means everything's falling apart. The Russian stock market actually rose today after its big fall yesterday. But the banks have been showing signs of strain. Many foreign exchange bureaus have been closed. 
and some people have been unable to withdraw money from their accounts. In the last few days, the Russian financial markets have been in chaos. The Russian stock market, set up as the adventure into capitalism began in 1995, rose to a high of over 2,100 points in October 1997. It's fallen steadily ever since, leaving the index today at less than 600 points, barely a quarter of its level of a year ago. And Russia's been hit by a double whammy of falling shares and soaring interest rates. From the staggering level of almost 200%, Russia managed to bring its interest rates down as the economy stabilised last year. But this year, the cost of borrowing has shot up again. Foreign investors are demanding high returns to justify the high risks of investing in Russia. The fundamental problem is the weakness of the economy. Russia may have abandoned communism, but it's still a long way from a developed capitalist system. When this combine harvester company sold three of its machines to Bulgaria, it was paid in pickled gherkins. And the company's workers have been paid the same way. Western experts say Russia must now privatise more industries, tackle corruption and get businesses to use cash instead of barter. If they push ahead with those reforms over the next year or so, I think we could see a period of strong growth in Russia, 4 or 5% per annum for a considerable period of time. If they do not push ahead with those reforms, I feel we'll see stuttering growth and crisis from time to time, and it will take, in those circumstances, a very long time for the living standards of the Russian people to start to rise. In the past decade, the Russian people have been buffeted by massive changes. They've seen hyperinflation, unemployment, a soaring crime rate. The question now is how much more can they take? Russia is facing some grim prospects. The worst case would be if it can no longer pay its debts. That would cut off foreign investment for years to come. Short of that, it might devalue the ruble, as the speculator George Soros has advised. But that's risky. It would cause inflation by making foreign goods more expensive, and it might rock Russian banks, which have borrowed dollars. If prices keep rising and banks start to go bust, then political instability is very likely. The patience of the Russian people may run out. At